Merci bien. Um, hello, colleagues and friends. Good afternoon. My name is Nadej Ade. I am the facilitator of the Committee of Practice on Health Systems Planning and Budgeting, supported by the International Partnership Harmonization for Health in Africa. On behalf of this Committee of Practice, I welcome you all to this um, capacity building webinar. And um, this, uh, this webinar is on operational research and healthcare in low and medium resource settings. So our distinguished speaker today is um, Dr. J. F. Royston. Dr. Royston was former head of strategic analysis and operational research in the Department of Health for England and was also president of the Operational Research Society in the year 2012-2013. He's currently an independent analyst and researcher and um, it is my hope that what we will learn today will infuse in us the desire to learn more about this research approach and develop operational research in our various countries in Africa. Dr. Royston is going to present for about 45 minutes or an hour and then, and then a 30 minutes question and answer session will follow. So without any further delay, I invite um, Dr. Royston to start the webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Nadej, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm sorry that uh, I speak very little French, so my talk will be in English. Uh, I will try to speak uh, slowly. I'll, I'll just try that very last uh, part in French, the only bit of French I'll do today. Um, je suis désolé, mais malheureusement, je parle seulement un petit peu le français. Donc, mon exposé sera fait en anglais. Je vais essayer de parler lentement. So, uh, operational research and healthcare in low and medium resource settings. This talk will be in four parts. I will say a little about operational research generally, a little about why it's important for healthcare still in fairly general terms. I'll then say something about operational research in low and medium resource settings, which obviously is the main focus for today. And then a little at the end about some thoughts on how operational research in low and medium resource settings might be developed and what's uh, hindering and what will help that. I should start off with a health warning. Um, you will know your own local situations and you will understand your problems uh, in depth. Uh, I obviously do not. What I can do is share with you my knowledge and experience of operational research in healthcare. You will have to decide how much of this is relevant and how useful in your own circumstances. So what is operational research? Um, operational research is the original term used in the, when it all started just before the Second World War. Um, but there are now other terms you may come across. Operations research, so how it's called in the United States. Operations analysis, sometimes a newer term, management science or management engineering. But I've also seen systems engineering, decision support, analytics, a new term. These all mean pretty much the, the, the same things, but I'll stick to the original term. If I had to use just one word to describe operational research, uh, I would say it's about improvement. And it is a, a rigorous um, uh, scientific approach, so we can call it an improvement science. And indeed, um, the OR society here and in America sometimes call, uh, use the phrase, the science of better, which gives you an idea of what we're about. But in slightly more detail, it's the science of improving particular things, systems and processes, often quite complex systems and often systems that are quite dynamic, involving resources, people, information, um, the things that underpin daily life in the real world. It is a, it is a real world uh, science. So three words then perhaps will help you. Uh, systems improvement science, I think, gives, gives a flavor of what operational research 
is about, but you'll see much more from actual examples as we go through. The actual methodology, um, there's two main strands to operational research. One is investigation. That could be through observation, through analysis, through modeling, through experiment. And the other strand is involvement, because it's a practical science. It involves working with users, with decision makers, and with other stakeholders. And put those two together, and that should produce some insight into some design and decision issues. And that then allows one to actually move on to improving them. So that's, if you like, the philosophy. And that means we look at questions like, how well is this system performing, uh, and why? What would count as an improvement, and who for? What changes might bring about improvements? How could we assess their likely success? What should work best? How can desired changes be implemented? What resources will be needed? What are the risks? How will we know if there has been an improvement? The approach follows what I would call a problem-solving learning cycle. Um, this could be usefully divided into four or five stages. The first stage, what I call the discovery stage, this is about understanding situations, diagnosing problems, defining goals. The second stage I'd call the design stage. This is where you're looking for things you might do, identifying options, trying to develop solutions to them. Then the next stage will be a decision stage, understanding the likely results of the things you're thinking of doing and choosing what you're going to do. And then the critical stage, the delivery stage, actually implementing a solution involving collaboration with key players, involving project management tasks. That sometimes will take you back in a loop to actually doing some similar things again, because you want to keep on improving. And that will involve evaluation and learning. Actually, the evaluation and learning will carry on all the way through that cycle at various stages. But it certainly will happen at the end of that cycle, or should do. Now, a key point here, this is quite a complex slide, but quite an important one. Um, operational search uses a broad spectrum of tools to analyze problems and identify solutions. Not all of the tools all of the time, but it has a, a, a toolbox it can draw on. And I put a few of them down here, and it's worth spending a little time on this slide. The top left-hand corner, you'll see it says accepting uncertainty, because the tools towards the left acknowledge that the world is quite often an uncertain place, but there are things we can do about it things like brainstorming, things like scenario analysis. On the bottom right, however, where it says seeking certainty, it also acknowledges that some parts of the world you can actually pin down and analyze quite uh, rigorously. And there you might do statistical analysis or some computer modeling. If you look at those methods, on the left, we've got methods which are largely qualitative, sometimes described as soft methods. On the right, we've got methods that are largely quantitative, sometimes described as hard methods. Incidentally, hard methods are not necessarily any more difficult than soft methods. So it doesn't mean hard in the sense of difficult. Um, If we go up the vertical axis, then the methods towards the top left tend to be ones you use in groups. And the ones down towards the bottom are ones you can do sitting at a desk on your own. So I think there are two useful ways of categorizing those methods, ranging from things that are qualitative and you do in groups to things that are quantitative and you can do as an individual. You'll notice. In the middle of that chart, there are three tools with the word system in them. And I'll be talking a bit more about that later, because system methods and tools are 
uh, a very important core part of operational research. Um, another thing to say is that operational research tackles both strategic and tactical issues. So strategic issues might be things like uh, what are likely needs for healthcare in the next decade? And how do we meet them? What should be our future plans for the healthcare workforce? How do we make best use of new technologies? Or tactical method things might be like, what size should this new healthcare facility be? How many drugs should we order next month? How do we arrange health worker visits to reduce travel times? Let's move on now to uh, something uh, more specifically about health. Why is operational research important in healthcare? Well, healthcare has a number of characteristics that are particular to health, uh, uh, sometimes uniquely uh, particular to health. Firstly, healthcare is a complex system. We all know this. Uh, here's a diagram here, um, with, which just shows that system in one way. Patients at the centre, then an outer circle, uh, an inner circle of, of what might be called the working environment, things like uh, staffing, um, infrastructure, money, uh, information. And then an outer circle of the wider environment, things that are not part of the healthcare system itself, but are very important influences on it, things like uh, demography or te technical change or public expectations. Another feature of healthcare is always changing. Uh, again, we need no reminder that diseases and crises can suddenly appear out of the blue. But on a more positive note, so can new ideas and new practices. Healthcare also has big areas of uncertainty. Um, I like to look at this in three different ways. Um, firstly, things that aren't too uncertain things you can see coming over the horizon. Imagine a, uh, a sailing boat coming over the horizon. You can see its sails. Things like demographic change. We know more or less what's going to happen there for several decades ahead in most places. And then, rather less certain, things I describe as grey shadows, things that are emerging from the mist, things like new technology, where we know sort of what's going to happen, but certainly not exactly. And then, what are called the, the black swans, the big surprises, things like AIDS or Ebola, things that we really, really don't know, see coming and have to deal with them when they come. Another feature of healthcare, hardly need to say anything more about this, is a risky business. I remember the first time I was involved in healthcare, uh, my then manager said, you know, hospitals are dangerous places. They're full of sick people and people are doing dangerous things. Uh, I tried to keep out of them if I were you. I think there's some, some truth in this. Lastly, again, we all know this. Healthcare is always under pressure. There's maybe uh, population pressures. There's pressures from treatments, pressures from new diseases, pressures from rising expectations from people. And against that, there are budgets are tight, workforces are short. Or always pressure. So there's five features of health, complexity, change, uncertainty, risk, pressure. And OR can help in all of those situations. Where things are complex, operational search can help clarify interactions. Where things are changing, OR can help foresee effects. Where things are uncertain, we can explore possibilities. Where things are risky, and we can test things out, particularly using computer simulation, where you don't have to do it for real. You can test it out safely first on a computer, perhaps, called, sometimes called a flight simulator test. And where things are under pressure, we can help show how to make best use of scarce resources. Let's give a few illustrations from health. These are not particularly from low and middle income countries. One or two are. Um, we'll come on to some of those later. So, just recapping slightly on what we said before, situations can be uncertain, complex, and changing. Something I haven't mentioned yet, there can be a flood of data. You can have lots of data, but not much knowledge. Um, often not known what will work best, or for that matter, what will work at all. 
And a couple of extra points I put in that I certainly have found very frequently important. People can often find quantitative information hard to understand, and yet analysis in OR will often produce that. So we have to have a way of helping people with that. And then last and certainly not leastly, decision makers, whether they're managers or clinicians or officials, are busy people, and we have to recognize that. So let's look at those. The first one, the black swan problem um, I, I picked here, but things that are complex and changing um, in some way. Um, I mentioned this already, the health trends, the white sales coming over the horizon, demography, but also obesity, or what about the impact of tobacco smoking, which we have a pretty good idea of how that could map out over the next few decades around the world. And then we have the black swans I mentioned already, AIDS, avian flu, Ebola. And we have to deal with both trends and discontinuities. Indeed, just to give you an example, there's been some talk uh, in the last decade or so about how healthcare may be turned upside down. On the left there, there's a model with professionals as the, uh, the key people and the self-care at the top of that pyramid balancing on it. And really thinking in the whole world, uh, developed as well as um, lesser developed countries, that maybe self-care is what we need to build on and only bring in professional care um, when you really need to. And that's, that's happening certainly in the UK. There's been a, a quite a lot of moves to that in the last decade or so. And I think it will be a global uh, trend. And obviously, where resources are tight, that can be an important uh, contribution of recognizing that patients are the primary resource in healthcare. Complexity can sometimes be usefully investigated with computer modeling tools and other um, hard modeling ideas. Remember the soft hard spectrum I mentioned before. So that's certainly one feature. But, uh, and modeling is a well established tool. Let's say epidemiology, many people will be familiar using um, mathematical and computer models in epidemiology. There's a very simple uh, diagrammatic model here. And if you plug that sort of model of uh, an epidemic into a computer, you get the typical epidemic curve on the bottom right there. But something I did want to emphasize today, what are technically soft approaches can often provide valuable insights. I've mentioned um, scenario analysis already, but also what are called problem structuring approaches, which are part of a, uh, a systems approach and things like systems mapping. These are qualitative approaches um, often done in groups, don't require computers, don't require any technology, don't require much data, and can be very useful in the sort of environments that I think some of you will find yourselves uh, in. I'll give an example of that. There's obviously not time today to give many examples of tools in any depth, but I've just got one here just to give a flavor. An example of a system mapping uh, approach or, or problem structuring approach. Root cause analysis. Um, as the name suggests, this comes from thinking about uh, a problem that appears on the surface, the weed, and what's going on underneath it, the root, the underlying causes. So schematically, you have a problem at the top and then various causes underneath that and various sub-causes we see here cause one, cause 1.1, cause 1. Point, et cetera, um, underneath that. Um, it's called the fishbone diagram for fairly obvious reasons. Here's a simple example with hospital costs. Supposing you have a healthcare facility or a hospital, for example, and the costs were high. You might be thinking, how could we do something about that? And the first step would be to think, why are costs high? Well, two obvious reasons. It might be because you've got a lot of costs, uh, of unit costs are high. Each day in a bed is costing you a lot of money. Um, and then you think, why might that be? Well, it might be because we're using a lot of resources, or maybe we're using expensive resources. But another reason could be you've got a high volume of bed days. And again, you would pin, you'd track that down to the underlying causes of that cause. Might be you have a lot of people coming in, high admissions. It might be they stay a long time. And in turn, you could disentangle those and look for finer roots uh, of those. So you would begin to actually build up a picture of why 
the problem might be taking place. Indeed, this is sometimes called the five whys approach. The suggestion is that if you have a problem you want to analyze, you should track down, you should ask the question why five times until you get to the really underlying causes. Incidentally, the five whys can also be turned into five hows because you want a solution, not just to understand the problem. So you could actually think of a solution. What does that require? And what does that requirement require? And in turn, what does that requirement require? So you're asking how, how, how do we do this? And how do we do that all the way up? As I mentioned, root cause analysis is a simple example, though quite a powerful one, of a core tool of OR, systems thinking. Remember, I mentioned these three systems tools uh, at the center of the OR tools. Another systems approach is systems mapping, which I think is probably the most central tool of all and the starting point for a lot of OR projects, sometimes called an influence diagram. Here's one um, uh, which you may not be able to see the details too well, but don't worry. This is just to give you a flavor. This was to actually look at what is driving epidemics and all the factors that might be driving epidemics and on the outer in the orange squares, the various uh, things that might be done to try to reduce or mitigate an epidemic um, and where in the system they might impinge and have their effect. So you begin to actually build out a map of uh, what's important in this situation and what you might do about it and how these things fit together. And one thing I wanted to emphasize about influence diagram and system mapping. This can be a very powerful thing to do with a group of people. If you've got stakeholders, you might have doctors, nurses, officials, um, other, other people involved uh, in dealing with the situation. Building a map together can build a shared understanding of all the different bits of the system and the different roles people are playing in it, and therefore different how interventions might take place. Again, not time to go into detail today. I will be giving some references at the end where you'll be able to follow up some of these tools. Just to mention that systems thinking is a bit different from traditional thought. It's one of its big advantages. Traditional thinking, for instance, quite often focuses on particular events. It's rather static, whereas systems thinking tends to be dynamic. You're looking at changes in patterns in behavior over time. Traditional thinking tends to be to focus on the details, to actually look at the trees, whereas systems thinking tends to look at the wider context, look at the forest. And systems thinking, uh, traditional thinking tends to be quite uh, linear, looking at does A, is A caused by B, whereas systems thinking is looking more for loops. Does A caused by B, which is caused by C, which is affected by A? Is there some cycle going on here? That makes life more complicated, but is often the key to actually how to control and manage the system better. System thinking has been recognized. I noticed in WHO publications has been recognized as of increasing importance in global health issues as things get more complex and as things get have bigger, more system wide effects then the need for systems thinking is, 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 is that much greater. Um, this is another example about data, a lot, a lot of data, but not much knowledge. Um, this is where analytics, remember one of those words I mentioned, is a, another word that's sometimes used for operational research. If there's a lot of data involved, it quite often the term analytics is used. And modeling in particular can add value here. There's three sorts of analytics quite often determined. There's the what's happened, descriptive analytics, the what's could happen, predictive analytics, and there's what's best, prescriptive analytics. And if we look here, if you're trying to see what's happened, you might actually do something to visualize your data, might do a bit of simple statistical modeling. Um, if you're looking at what could happen or what's best, then you might do some systems modeling, you might do some simulation, you might even run some more sophisticated optimization models. And OR is very engaged with healthcare analytics, and there's been some new groups set up to look at this particular feature. So where you've got a lot of data to manage, this is very powerful 
area to think about. Let's move on to another example. This one actually does come um, from uh, low and middle income uh, country work and is actually a bit of work that I've been involved in lately. This is about helping evaluation. Because if you don't know what's going to work, you're going to have to do some evaluation. Um, and this works from looking at the use of mobile phones for delivering essential healthcare information in low resource settings. This is delivering information to um, uh, healthcare workers, but also directly to citizens, patient, uh, parents, and so on. I don't need to remind you, I think, that um, uh, mobile phones have gone global. Uh, the growth rate is quite astonishing and predicted um, to rise uh, at an astonishingly fast rate in the next five, ten years. Um, I notice for Africa that just the use of internet use on mobile phones is predicted to rise 20-fold over the next five years. Um, the Afrobarometer survey gives some interesting use, information about mobile phone use in many countries in Africa. Remarkably high penetration of mobile phones um, in, in many, many countries. Uh, another slide showing more or less the, the same thing in terms of rapid growth and its importance. And not surprisingly then, mobile phones are increasingly being used in healthcare around the globe. Here's just three recent reports on this topic. One of the problems is that evaluation of all this use of mobile phones in healthcare is very patchy. Um, and one of the reasons it's patchy is that nobody seems to have thought very much about what are the right criteria for evaluating mobile health applications in low resource settings. And this is some work I've been involved in. I shan't go through the details here, but this was basically establishing some relevant criteria. And once we did this, um, one could actually begin to assess the potential of different applications. Now, I must explain this chart. Um, around, the around the edge of the circle are various, criteria, various facets things that might be important, like the target audience or the cost per user or the, um, the ease of uh, relating a piece of information to practical action. Um, the, more you, the better an application scores on that, the more of the circle it will fill in. So you'll see that one application we looked at, Health Phone, which is a system um, now being rolled out um, to 250 million people in India just last month, um, this started. Um, we looked at that application, which scores very well. The circle, blue circle, is not far off being filled in. Compared with Smart Health, which is an application um, which Samsung introduced in uh, Africa. I think it's putting it on all its mobile phones being sold in Africa. And at the moment, at least, it doesn't score very well because it's missing one or two important features in terms of accessibility and um, the practicality of some of the information on it, which seems to be. Um, a bit patchy. I'm sure it'll develop better, but it need, does need some development. So this is why evaluation is useful. It shows you where things need to be um, developed to be reach their maximum potential. Let's uh, move on to the last two examples. Um, I mentioned one about the problem of quantitative information. Um, and I think today there is information that's quantitative that has to be got across. The key is to communicate these insights visually. Uh, I've got an example here, which, um, oh yes, firstly a warning. Um, where people have not absorbed information properly, and particularly this is a problem with quantitative information, they're likely to have the wrong mental model, uh, the wrong measure and the wrong mental model of some situation. And this can be damaging to an organization's health and to people's own health. And I've got two examples to illustrate this. First one, a slightly complex slide, I'll take you through it. On the left, this is an example of, about the effect of bed occupancy in a healthcare facility on the ability of that healthcare facility to admit patients. So think, can, can a hospital admit patients um, at any particular time? Now, a lot of people's model, it was certainly true in the United Kingdom, what our Treasury used to think some years ago, um, is that all our hospitals, they wanted us to run them full the whole time. And their view was that uh, until a hospital was almost completely full, we could, we'd always be able to admit people because we'd got empty beds. So their view was the view on the left, that you can run with an average bed occupancy that's um, right up to very nearly 100% before you'll have problems admitting anybody. 
The problem with that view is it's, it suffers from what's called the flaw, the flaw of averages. It ignores variation in demand. What happens if a sudden group of people suddenly appear at the hospital entrance gates? Um, unless you've got some more than just the old one spare bed, you're not going to be able to admit them. And if you do the, 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 the analysis behind this, you can actually work out to get a graph like the one on the right, which shows you a more realistic view of what happens in terms of your ability to admit a sudden peak load of people as your average bed occupancy uh, rises. And you'll see that at, well, for this particular sort of hospital, may not be true for other sorts of hospital, but the same pattern will be true. The numbers will be different. That once you get to 90% occupancy, you began to get a little bit of a problem. You get to 95% occupancy and you suddenly start running into really big problems with emitting sudden peak loads of people. So it's important to have the right model of how a hospital works, even for simple things like this. And a visual picture like this showing the graph is a way of getting that across without having to go into all the detailed mathematics. Give another example, which is not about problems that the wrong sort of views of the numbers can give to an organization, but what the wrong sort of views of the numbers can give to individuals and their health. Um, in Europe, there was some years back what was called a, 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 a scare about the oral contraceptive pill. The newspapers picked up some research which said that the mortality risk had doubled. Now, this may or may not have been true, but let's assume it's true for the moment. So the paper said that there's a double risk of a fatal thrombosis from taking these pills. And as a result of the newspaper publicity, a large proportion of women stopped taking their uh, medication. And as a result of that, there was a big increase in the number of uh, unwanted pregnancies and, and, and indeed in abortions in the following year. What the papers hadn't told people was that this doubled risk had doubled from something extremely small, about two fatal episodes per million women per year, to something that was still extremely small, about four fatal episodes per million women per year. And once that sort of message got out, people took a quite different view. So getting across the right message was really important. And we have learned over the recent years what the best way of getting across messages like that are. And that's not to talk about the numbers, but to try to use graphics. Here's a slightly different example about statins. This is a attempt to get across to people what the benefits uh, of taking statins might be. Here's 100 people, and we're assuming they all take statins to stop heart, heart attacks and strokes. Out of that 100 people, 90 people, in whatever time period we're looking at, will not get a heart attack or a stroke. Seven people will, even though they're using statins, they're the red dots, the red faces, the yellow faces, that's just three people, are three people who would have had a heart attack or a stroke, but because they're taking statins, will not. So that is the benefit of statins. Not as big as some people may be thinking, but not tiny either. But you can immediately see, without having to struggle with the numbers, what the effects are. So the recommendation is that whenever you're trying to get certainly any message about risks across, but many other messages as well, Use something visual like this before you get into the numbers, which may be confusing. Last example, last general example. What to do about busy decision makers? And my advice here, at least, is to try to keep things simple and particularly to use, where possible, what were called fast and frugal analysis. What I mean by this are things like the APGAR score is a good example. There are lots of scores for uh, testing uh, health of newborn babies. Some of them are very complicated and sophisticated. But the APGAR score is very simple. It just measures five things and has three items, three things you score on. And the thing about the APGAR score is it works almost as well, in fact, as well in practice um, as the more complicated methods. And it has the huge advantage that because it's simple, it's likely to be used, whereas complicated methods generally aren't used. They're just too difficult 
for busy people to use. So this is what I mean by, by trying to look for um, uh, fast and frugal, s simple analysis that can nevertheless be powerful. Other examples, things like checklists um, can be very useful. Uh, all the work by Atul Gawande, uh, very important, useful work. And things like nudge, where you're just um, looking for where a very small thing can have a big effect. That's beginning to take us outside the strict realms of operational research. So just to recap on those illustrations. So situations can be uncertain, complex and changing. And R can help map and navigate in such environments. There's often a flood of data, but a drought of knowledge. Modeling can add value to big data analytics. It's often known what will work best or better or at all. So R can help in encouraging and assisting evaluation. People can find quantitative information, the sort that comes out of analysis quite often, hard to understand. So OR needs to communicate key insights visually. And decision makers are busy. So where possible, try to keep analysis simple with fast and frugal approaches. We move on now to some things that are specifically about lower middle income countries. It's often said that when you're looking at health across the whole world, that, that one of the big problems is this fog of delivery, that the delivery problems, uh, we require not only increasing resources, we all know we need, everywhere needs more resources, but we need to make best use of what resources there are. And that sometimes is something we can do something out, about more easily than increasing resources. For instance, it was estimated that the millennium goal of preventing two thirds of global child deaths could be achieved if existing implementation interventions were fully implemented. Interventions that are effective in trial conditions are often much less effective in real world conditions where these operational problems, delivery problems, for example, can be crucial. So we've got questions like what sort of resources will really be required? What assists or impedes delivery? How can all the components work together to best effect? What impacts would various levels of implementation have? And these are all uh, a challenge to operational research and management science because they're the sort of things that operational research uh, certainly should be able to help with. One thing to mention, um, although we're going to talk here about sort of downstream research, if you like, delivery certainly is a quite a downstream research, that can inform upstream developments. Um, it, operational research is not an alternative to clinical and laboratory research. It's an adjunct to it and an ally of it, because it can add some real world leverage uh, to it. I sometimes like to think of this as like a river. We might be working mostly where the river meets the sea, but you can actually, the sea feeds back rain uh, upstream. So there's a feedback mechanism there. The immediate um, service delivery focus can give you knowledge, which can be crucial in informing upstream developments maybe directing where new clinical research should be focused. There's been actually quite a lot of useful operational research on, on global health issues around the world. Uh, I look back, you can go back to the 1980s, and there was some work done by USA, the pre core studies in uh, 32 different countries looking at uh, those sorts of issues. Um, the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, for a long time, has been leading operational research products, and that lies behind the WHO DOT strategy. Um, quite a lot of work on HIV and AIDS, of course. I noticed the OR Society produced a little booklet on OR, the, on OR work on HIV and AIDS back in, 20 years ago. Uh, more recently, things like the Clinton Center on HIV doing modeling work. Quite a lot of useful work has been going on. Um, but let's look at some of those future global health delivery challenges and see where our has been helping. Here's a slightly uh, modified example, uh, version of the cycle I showed before, because uh, I've added a couple of bits at the end. So we've got a cycle here where there's issues, if you're looking at health delivery, firstly identifying problems and potential interventions, then choosing interventions, then introducing interventions, then scaling them up and then integrating them into wider health systems and some evaluation all throughout that. If we look at some examples here, 
Identifying problems, that's where scenario analysis and other futures methods can help. Um, choosing interventions, that's a good role for modeling work to actually do rapid assessment of interventions where there might not have enough time to do a full field experiment. Um, looking at introducing and scaling up interventions, then there's a whole lot of things where you're deciding uh, local uh, uh, levels of workforce and such like there, bread and butter work for our. Let's look at, sorry, let's look at some examples. Um, Rwanda, there was a simulation model which actually showed how um, different arranging of the workforce could actually deliver the same services with considerably uh, reduced, uh, less staff required. Um, some work on cervical cancer programs in developing countries, some systems analysis work showed how um, the performance would be affected by different factors, uh, helps disentangle that. Um, I mentioned scenario, so scenario analysis in, in Africa uh, on AIDS up to 2025, looked at possible um, futures for that. And a rather um, esoteric example, um, there was some work by NASA using satellite uh, imagery um, and computer modeling, which alerted uh, authorities in Kenya to an outbreak of an epidemic. I, I just, that's not a typical example. I just put that in because it was a rather um, unusual one. So there are already some valuable contributions to global health delivery. Um, last one I wanted to pick there, um, polio management, a rather important system dynamics uh, modeling work, which actually won a prize on showing the best strategy for managing uh, polio. I'm going to give a couple of examples in a little bit more detail. These are from contacts of mine um, in, in Africa, who I've talked to recently. Um, this one was very a very bread and butter uh, task determining staffing requirements at a community healthcare facility in rural Uganda. This was a problem where traditional methods fail to take account of wide local variations. Um, and the approach the operational search working there uh, adopted was to use the WHO's workload indicators for staffing needs. That's been developed to be designed to be simple to operate and use. Um, the main steps, like any uh, workload uh, uh, method, um, you look at the work areas to cover, you look at the workload components, you set some activity time standards and some activity volumes, and from that you can actually work out different sorts of staffing. And indeed they did that at this healthcare facility um, and estimated the staff required for paediatric ward, outpatients, surgery, etc. Of course, there's a snag here. This assumes work is completely predictable. And you remember from what I said earlier on that one of the problems in healthcare is work is not completely predictable. So there's been a second stage to this work where having done the basic work, let's assume it's all predictable to get a first idea of what staffing we need, and then went on to look at the variability of the workload. Um, and then started to look at options of how to deploy staff more flexibly to avoid overstaffing individual departments, um, but still to be able to deal with peaks and troughs. Um, uh, and they're still looking at that and looking to use some new IT that they've got to actually uh, monitor that work um, uh, more carefully and maybe do some modeling work, which they haven't yet done on that. Another example, a slightly more strategic example, that was a very tactical example I've just given, a slightly more strategic example in Zambia, um, pharmaceutical distribution. Pharmaceutical distribution obviously is from manufacturers to wholesalers to pharmacies, the hospitals, the patients. Um, the problem uh, is that um, in many countries, certainly many uh, middle income countries, um, the end result is low availability of essential medicines to patients. The Zambian study I'm referring to found that up to 30% of the facilities they looked out uh, ran out of a particular important medicine uh, at some periods, even though there was plenty of that medicine available at the national warehouse. So what they did was a combination of field experiments and computer modeling to look at different designs for the pharmaceutical uh, supply chain. Um, they actually looked at uh, what was happening they estimated what would happen under different scenarios, did some modeling work, to, and used that to evaluate various changes that could affect availability. 
result of that, they found that the inventory control policies that were widely recommended at that time for distributing medicines, at least in sub-Saharan Africa, didn't allow adequately for common situations involving variable demand and interruptions to things like road access, where roads get blocked in bad weather. Um, and also that the stockouts were because there was too much reliance on average past monthly use. So they came up with some supply chain redesigns that would increase drug availability and reduce inventory costs without requiring any increase in the total amount of that drug of the drugs being bought nationally. And they're currently field testing this work to see if that can be fully implemented. Okay, so that was a few examples um, from uh, middle countries. I just wanted to finish off the last five minutes by uh, highlighting a few development challenges. How could operational research be further developed in low and medium resource settings? And really that's looking at the sort of obstacles there are, the gaps there are. And I picked out five. There's problems about funding, the issues about methods, there's issues about links, there's issues about implementation, and there's issues about skills. The first gap is funding. There's very limited funding support to operational research in global health. Global health research funding is heavily weighted towards these upstream areas, like developing new vaccines and drugs, obviously important, but only about 3% of funding, for instance, from the US National Institute of Health is research on delivery and use on, on wide global health problems, a very small portion. There are some good signs. The, for instance, the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB and malaria actually specifies that it allows us 5 to 10% of every grant to be allocated for monitoring, evaluation and operations research. And that's good news, although when I last checked, it looked to me like about 1% was actually being spent on these things, so maybe a tenth of what they say should be spent, so it's still underfunded. Um, in the UK, I did notice our own Department for International Development does include operational research in its priority areas, so hopefully there'll be funding a bit more of it. Second gap methods. Now this goes back to this um, problem about the use of tools. If you look at the literature, and again in the references I give at the end, there is some of this literature, operational search seems to be used to, for almost any improvement oriented investigation into a program's operations, so that's fine. But in operational social management science, there tends to be more of a focus on using modeling and related analytical techniques. And there's actually a problem with both of those. Um, oh, before I get on to that, for instance, uh, operational research and management science tools are not mentioned in the current guidance on operational research in global health that WHO and USA put out. They just talk about surveys and such like, which are important, but are a small portion of the total methodologies available. So, as I mentioned before, and all this list, none of those are mentioned in that guidance. Now, what we want, I think, is something which combines the two. Current studies um, are risk being what I describe as light on methodology and have lots of field work, but not enough rigor. Some of the management science stuff risks being over sophisticated without with insufficient practical relevance. So I think there's two problems. Not enough anal analysis, there's not enough rigor. Too much analysis, it gets maybe not, enough, not practical enough. What we want is that sweet spot in the middle, which is a focus on practical problem solving and an appropriate use of analytical techniques. And that's, I think, a key development task for operational research in health. Um, this was just a slide to look at modeling versus experiment and just to say it's not actually to say you shouldn't do uh, one or the other, it's to actually point out that they can be used both together and make a very powerful combination. I shan't go into details on that now. Um, you won't be able to see too much of this slide, but I just picked it up because I did notice that some work in a university in Uganda had actually adopted what I suggest is the right approach, which actually uses field studies and model building. You look at the top right here, it talks about field studies and about model building. So builds those two approaches into an integrated framework, and I think that is the way forward. Third gap actually flows from the, from the gap I've just mentioned. The global health research communities and the operational research communities are not strongly linked enough. Um, this is to some extent the gap between 
laboratory and clinical research and field and, and delivery research, but there's other sorts, examples of that gap um, that needs to be addressed. Let's move on. This is a key one. Implementation. Any operational research study has to jump over a whole lot of hurdles if it's going to be useful. It has to be available, it has to be visible, it has to be relevant, it has to be affordable, it has to be comprehensible, it has to be convincing, it has to be practical, it has to be timely, and so on. This is not news. Um, there was a good paper in The Lancet a few years back um, from Medicines on Frontier A and others pointing out how operational research in low-income countries, what it needed to be. It needed to be relevant. It needed to be done in partnership with local programs. It needed to build local research capacity and so on. And indeed, that study I mentioned from the 1980s came up with similar um, uh, requirements. So we, we know what they are. The common feature in both of those is about skills. Um, nearly all the work has stressed the importance of capacity strengthening and mentoring of researchers and investigators in the relevant countries. A good example I mentioned before, the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease has adopted a process to actually develop local people and to train and lead them to champion and do operational research. And there are a number of centres for operational research on global health issues. Um, I mentioned the uh, International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease Centre already, but these, the Clinton Foundation Centre on HIV Operations Research, there's the Operational Research Unit of Medicines on Frontier, there's other groups like the Schistomyces Consortium, um, a whole lot of uh, projects around universities, such as the Global Health Delivery Project at Harvard, uh, and many others, including some in the United Kingdom, by the way. There is one common feature to all of these. They're all based in the industrialized world, and I think that is a situation which can and should only be temporary. Uh, these have got to spread out to, so things are happening actually in the relevant country itself, and that's going to take some time, but it's starting. Time for some conclusions, I think. This is my, uh, almost my last slide. So what I would conclude, operational research is a powerful real world science for improving complex systems and health in low middle income countries as elsewhere is certainly a complex issue. There has been and is some useful operational research on health issues in low and middle income countries. A greater use needs to be made in global health of the whole range of OR analytical tools, not just surveys and data collection. There needs to be field work and modelling together to make a powerful combination. Quantitative tools are important, but some qualitative methods, especially systems matching, do not need large amounts of data or computing. They can help communication between different stakeholders and can add powerful insights. Finally, analysts from higher income countries can contribute, but the great gains will come from lower middle income countries increasing their own capacity for operational research in health. And I think I should stop there and hand, up, hand back to Nadeje and any questions or comments. There are at the end a couple of slides with a whole lot of references of books and articles. Um, thank you very much. Um, Dr. Royston, on behalf of the Committee of Practice and all the participants present, this was a, a really good presentation, very detailed and informative. So thank you very much for that. I'm sure many of you have questions, and so we will start immediately with the uh, question answer session. If you have a question, simply type question in the instant messaging chat box to your left at the bottom of, at the, bottom of the software. I'll be able to see your name and invite you to ask your question orally. To do that, you'll need to activate your microphone. Otherwise, you can just type your question and then I'll read it out. So we can start. Does, um, does anybody have any questions to ask? Okay, so I'll be the first, Dr. Royston. Okay. Right. Um, 
Okay, so we have we have one question from Stefan. Is it possible to ask questions in French? Yes, you can ask it, and I'll try to translate. Yes, you can ask questions in French. So activate your microphone and ask ask your question, Stefan. Oui, c'est bon. Vous m'entendez? Oui, on vous entend. D'accord. Euh, donc je suis Stéphane Dalbeda, je suis euh, expert en suivi et évaluation de projets de santé et je voulais savoir quel lien euh, le présentateur fait entre euh, la recherche opérationnelle et le suivi et évaluation des projets ou des, oui, des projets ou des programmes. Quel lien il fait? D'accord, merci. Ok, um, so Dr. Ryston, we have a question from Stéphane and he wants to know what link you make between operational research and um, monitor monitoring and evaluation research of programs? What is the link between those two? Operational research and monitoring and evaluation of projects or programs? Okay. Um, there is uh, an overlap. Uh, and indeed, I would say that evaluation uh, should form part of operational research work in the sense that if you are doing some operational research work, you will need to do some evaluation to actually check that anything you are proposing and is implemented is actually working as you think it should be. Um, I will, I'll add another point first, but you might want to translate that back. No, I think he understands. Yeah. Stay understand? okay. Ça va, ça va, j'ai compris, compris ce qu'il a dit. Yeah. I, I would just add one other point to that is that um, some operational research workers, myself included, do do evaluation work. And so I would not draw a strong distinction uh, between the two. Some people do, some people don't. But um, I think they're all aiming to improve the situation uh, by some fairly um, rigorous study. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. We have a question from Mosemma. Mosemma, do you want to activate your microphone and ask your question orally, or do you want to type it out? Uh, do, you, do you hear me, please? Okay, we're Can listening you to you. Hear me? Okay, thank Can you. Hear? I want to ask a question to the presenter about research from Africa. How, how do, 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 do you think we, we can we can improve this uh, operational research in, in, in our, our setting. How do you how, think we, we can improve it in our, our setting here? I, 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 I couldn't quite hear that. The sound is not very good. Okay. From so the question from Osema was, what are you, what do you, how do you think um, researchers from Africa can improve operational research in their respective countries? So what are the that steps that they need to take to improve, um, to develop operational research in their countries? Okay. Okay. That will, of course, depend on what your particular problems and issues are, whether they are ones of method or ones of how we work with doctors and managers or, or what, or, or skills development. Um, do you have a particular issue in mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have many problems about uh, uh, about uh, about uh, patients, maybe about imp implementation of many problems. So you said that it's important for us to to learn our problem and to try to to, to to solve them. So I think I want to know we have no center of patients in our, in Africa, but right. how do you think we can uh, manage them our problems uh, right. without center of of our personal research? Right. Thank, thank you. I think that is a very important issue. Um, yeah. In the short term, I think the approach may be to link up with places that do have such centers, perhaps in the industrialized world or elsewhere, and use their assistance to build up your own capacity so eventually you would be able to do these things on your own. Mm -hmm. Okay. 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 I understand you. Okay. okay so That's we good. have another question from Abby. Abby wants to know how ethical clearances differ in operational research and other researches. 
Right. That, that is, that is a, another interesting question. Um, it may be different in uh, different countries because, um, uh, for obvious reasons, um, in the UK, for example, it tends to be easier to get ethical clearance for operational research because it rarely involves clinical interventions. It is more organizational interventions. Sometimes that will not be true and the appropriate ethical clearance will be required. But sometimes the work will be classified more as, say, like consultancy than as like clinical research. And it is easier to get the clearance if it is that sort of work. Okay, thank you. Abby, is that all right? Or you have another question? All right. Um, the next question is from Priscilla. Priscilla says that um, she's a field-based employee and she doesn't really quite understand how field study can be combined with modeling. Okay. Um, you may do a field study in which you uh, collect some data, possibly about a new intervention or a change to an intervention. Um, it may be survey data. It may be experimental data if you have done a, a, a more ambitious study. The way that modeling will work is it will take that data and use that to build a model that describes the situation you are studying. This could be a, uh, an influence diagram or it could be a computer model. All of these are models. Um, once you have that model, you can then begin to explore other possibilities for changing your situation, which you may not have had time or resources to study on the ground. So a simple example that may not be relevant in your situation. If one was looking at a screening program to actually for screening for some uh, disease, your field work might have done a study in which you screened people every year, for example. And you want to know what would happen if we screen people every six months or every three years, then you will probably have enough information from your field study to build a model to answer those other questions. So you will be able to answer a wider range of questions than the field study alone would allow you to. Okay. Um, we have another question from We have another question from, hold on, from Zakariu. And his question is, what is the link between global health research and operational research in health? Yes, uh, my point here was that the links are not sufficiently strong. Um, most of the health research, uh, global health research, apart from laboratory and clinical research, tends to be um, social research, um, other sorts of um, uh, field research. Um, most operational research has more analytical content than that. And the two could usefully learn from each other by having people that work in both communities. There are some examples of people who do. I mentioned the International Union for Tuberculosis and Lung Disease and people like Anthony Harris um, does have a foot in both camps, um, but they are few and far between. Okay, thank you. Abby, do you want to ask your question orally? We can hear you. Abby? Thank can you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. 
how can uh, we demystify modeling for uh, researchers in low-income countries? Okay, thank you for that question. Uh, another important issue. I think um, the first step, perhaps, um, is the same as in any country, actually. Uh, we must not make too much distinction between different countries. We can all learn from each other and all have more in common than, um, than some people think. The, my starting point for anybody is to do system mapping because that is a low technology modeling approach which can bring great insights. Uh, it is also a first step to what might be building a computer model, which may or may not be a necessary second step, depending on the circumstances. So start off with those sorts of qualitative approaches, particularly the mapping approaches that can be done in groups. Again, the references at the end of my talk give you some uh, texts for that. Um, if we are talking about um, uh, more mathematical modeling, then uh, it depends a bit whether we are going to be uh, using computers or not. Computer mm -hmm. simulations are becoming uh, simpler to use. Computers are becoming cheaper to use. Um, there are uh, tools available now uh, which people can do computer modeling um, quite easily without a great deal of technical computer or mathematical expertise. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have a question from Mosema, um, and she wants to know what is the validity of results from operational research as compared to other classical research methods, um, clinical uh, and laboratory research? Okay, there is no single answer to that question because it will the validity will be as good as the work is. Uh, you can build a good model or a bad model. You can do a good field study or a bad field study. Um, and operational research involving those will be as good as those studies. Um, it is true that compared with, say, a randomized control trial, which incidentally I would not regard as something different from operational research. I have done randomized control trials as part of an operational research study, but that may be less common um, in this area. But a, a randomized control study um, has certain inbuilt validity to it in a way that modeling will not. You do, there are some extra risks to modeling. You may have the wrong model. You may have collected the wrong data. You may uh, have other issues about it. So you do need to check the logic and the data. Perhaps um, perhaps that's an extra step to make sure that the modeling work is, is valid. But many people do this. This is not a uh, not necessarily a major problem. OK, thank you. We have the next question from Jibril. Jibril, do you want to activate your microphone and um, ask your question? Jibril, we can hear you. Can, you. can you ask your question? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. OK. Um, I'm Jibril. I'd like to ask um, a question. Sorry, I missed parts of the meeting and um, uh, didn't get the whole, the whole information. However, we're involved in trauma research in my hospital in Nigeria. And um, we've published some epidemiologic uh... Oops, I've, I've lost it. Yes. Uh, there seems to be a problem with, with, with um, his connection. So I'm just going to, going to read out his question. So he said some years back in, in my hospital located in Nigeria, I and some colleagues started a trauma research. Sorry, a trauma research 
group. We collected data and published epidemiologic studies, epidemiological studies. However, recently we started thinking about intervention studies and we have identified some problems, e.g. poor pre-hospital care. Is this in the realm of operational research? If it is, how can we be guided? Um, the answer to that is it, it, it may be. Um, there is, for instance, in the United Kingdom, a research unit specializing in clinical operational research, which is, I guess, is somewhat of a, uh, a boundary uh, area um, because most operational research will not get deeply involved in clinical issues. But there is one unit, the Clinical Operational, operational Research Unit at University College London. Um, I, one, I, so I can't say more than that about that particular question without more detail. I don't think there'll be time today. What I'm wondering from one or two of these questions, one's about uh, contacts that can help um, with particular methodologies, contacts that might be able to help with particular problems, about whether if we could put some of these together afterwards, I could um, either circulate a note of what I think might be some places worth contacting, or I could even circulate the questions to those places to see if any of those centers in the UK or in America or elsewhere would be interested and willing to pick them up and to liaise with people and maybe to assist people um, beyond that. Okay, that, that, is a, that is a very great suggestion. Um, thank you for that. So our next question is from Priscilla. Priscilla, do you want to ask ask your question orally? Uh, yes. Can I go ahead? Yes, you may. Um, I, I asked it previously a question on um, combining field study and modeling. Uh, recently, I conducted um, a research on understanding barriers to utilization of maternal and child health services in the context of uh, results-based financing. So the initial plan was to scale up these dialogues, but due to limited funding, we did not manage to scale them up. So because of um, this uh, new concept that I've learned today about modeling, I wanted to know from him how I can um, model, I can come up with a model so that it can be used on a, on a wider scale. That's my first question. And then um, I, was, uh, I also wanted to ask about uh, centers that train open knowledge online and the various methods uh, in detail, because today we, we will learn quite a lot in a very short um, space of time. So I think it would be good for me if there are any centers that train operational research. Okay. That's, that's all I have. Yeah. OK, yes, I've got, I've got that. Um, on your first question, that sounds like a question that would need quite a lot of discussion and study to give you a, a good answer on that, um, because it's basically how to design a second phase of a study. Um, again, I think, as in some of the other questions, um, it would be worth putting together all the questions like that that have come out of today and I may be able to respond a little bit more afterwards or to think about contacts of places that might be uh, willing to actually work and advise on that. On the second question, uh, interesting point about online training. Um, there are some, but I'm not sure that they, they tend to be specialized training in some of the more technical and mathematical parts of operational research rather than the uh, the sort of things we were talking about today. Um, I will I will check that out. Um, it might be something again which some of the centres that I mentioned earlier today might be interesting in developing because I could see that could be a very useful thing to do. So I'm I'm happy to take that away and to look at that and to see whether um, there's a way of coming up with a useful response on that. Thank you. Okay, so. Um... You all heard Dr. Rice, and if you have um, these uh, complex questions, you can either email them to me and, uh, and I will forward them to Dr. Rice, or he's going to circulate a note with contacts that I would later on share with you all. Okay, so I think our last question is from Vinny. 
And um, Vinny wants to know if you have any suggestions or a simple guideline or manual on how to do epidemiological modeling. Um, okay, there will be uh, a lot of text on that. It depends uh, a bit at what level you want to do the epidemiological modeling, uh, how wide the system you are looking at. Um, uh, hello? Hello? Yes. Actually, I have like a routine disease surveillance data. Right. At the district level. Okay, what, what I can do. What if I, I want to develop like. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, the, the sound is breaking up. But what. what for the malaria cases yeah I'm sorry the sound is, is is very poor but not don't don't worry what I will do in this um, uh, note that um, we'll be developing to put around afterwards I will include something on sources for epidemiological modeling um, right we have um, another question from Basalia. I'm just going, it's in French, so I'm just going to read it and translate. All right, so his question is how can we, um, how can we get um, partners, uh, financial partners to be interested in operational research so that they can fund it in countries? And another another important issue, a very important issue. I, I mentioned earlier that there seems to be, although some of the funding bodies, such as um, uh, the, the Gates Foundation, um, have recognised the importance of operational research, as indeed has WHO, and have uh, said that certain amounts of money, five to ten percent, in the case of the Gates uh, Foundation should be spent on such act activities, the actual amount is much less. I think there's various reasons for this. Some of them are that it um, doesn't look so exciting as basic research. Um, others may be that it involves um, more work with local uh, practitioners because it is uh, a practical topic. I, I, I don't know all the reasons, but uh, what is uh, required is some understanding of uh, what it can deliver. Um, and maybe there's also a problem with that the funding isn't there because there aren't enough people and skills to actually do it. And, and you can't fund something that isn't there without building it up. So it might be a bit of a vicious circle, which we need to break into um, to actually develop the skills. Once there's more people that can do this sort of work, then maybe more funding will flow into it. Okay, thank you. There is another question from Mosema, and I think this question is very much linked to the question I had. He wants to know if um, operational research can be done, can be applied in in um, other fields like clinical, the, cl the clinical field, epidemiology, and not. And not just in in apply in a, well not just in, in the intervention field like working with NGOs, but my own question was: it seems very very much um, it seems to me that operational research is more concerned with practical questions, um, field based and all that. Can we also do operational research in health policy, looking at health policy questions and um, the interactions between stakeholders in the in the political environment, is has that been done before, or is that is there? Um, is yeah, there yes. There? Yeah, yes, indeed, indeed. Much of my uh, career was spent advising policy uh, makers, and that's because there is this link between what goes on on the ground, which is certainly something of great interest in operational research, and policy. Quite, you know, the, 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 what's the expression? The devil is in the detail. People will formulate grand policies which will fail because they didn't realize some important detail of how this would work or not work on the ground. So 
Um, the uh, the example I gave on bed occupancy was one example where we studied in hospitals and did the the field work and the modelling work required to understand how that aspect of a hospital worked and uh, how things would go wrong, uh, and that fed back up into policy about how hospitals should be funded because obviously if you're funding hospitals to deal with peak loads then you will fund them differently from if you we're not funding them. Similarly, work we did um, on uh, screening for cancer, where we did modelling work uh, on screening for cancer, uh, that influenced uh, the policies on screening, because although you're looking at how programmers work out um, uh, in delivery terms, uh, that will eventually have an impact uh, on policy. Similarly, we did a lot of work on waiting lists and waiting times, a problem in um, a lot of healthcare systems, certainly ones uh, funded in the way that the National Health Service in the UK is funded. Um, uh, we did a lot of modelling work about that, which underpinned the policy on what waiting times, for instance, what the maximum waiting time should be in particular specialties that was derived from operational research work. So unquestionably, operational research work can be used at the strategic and policy level as well as a tactical level. And one of the interesting things about it is how it can actually work as a bridge between those two levels. Almost a very important feature that it works as that bridge, a sort of two-way bridge between strategy and tactics and between policy and delivery. Okay, thank you. So we are heading to the end of our webinar, but we will take a last question from Basil. Basil, we are listening to you. Um, Basil, do you want to ask your question? Okay. So uh, I've got, I've, yes, I've, I've, I've just read it. I've just did it. Does operational research have the same chances of being published than other types of research? Um, there are plenty of um, operational research journals, though they may not be the ones that we're, me and other people we're talking uh, with today would be most interested in publishing because they tend to be fairly academic technical journals, though there are some exceptions. There's a journal called Health Systems, published by the Operational Research Society in the UK, um, which is quite practical. Um, also, I've uh, published, and many other operational researchers have published in The Lancet, the British Medical Journal, and so on. Um, I suspect it's slightly harder to get operational research published in some of these journals than others, uh, but, but it's certainly possible, and there certainly have been plenty of examples. Okay, so um, we are coming to an end of an end of the webinar. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Royston, for accepting our invitation to do a presentation on operational research. Um, and I also like to thank the participants for being present. I hope you have learned a lot. At the end of the webinar, at the end of the presentation, sorry, there is a list. Uh, there's a reference reference list that you could uh, look. You can check later on for more information on operational research. Yes, there it is. I will share with you this presentation, and you will also have the, uh, the, the audio recording of this webinar. And, and thank, thank you, Nadej. Um, if, you, if you do can collate any questions or issues from people, which could be usefully repeat ones they've already asked to remind me what they were, then I will try to write a note which will um, maybe answer some of them, but more importantly, perhaps give some pointers as to places and people that people might want to contact for further discussions and assistance. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Royston. So if you had any questions, you can email them to me and then we will share them with, uh, with Dr. Royston. Thank you very much, everybody, and have a good evening. Bye.